you're watching the Bible Explained, for kids, and this, is the book of Genesis. Genesis is like the very first episode of an amazing adventure story. It's the first book of the Bible, and it's full of incredible tales that split into two main parts. In chapters 1 to 11, Genesis weaves an epic tale about God's story in the world. And then, in chapters 12 to 50, Genesis zooms in close to focus on the incredible journey of one man, Abraham, and his entire family. The book starts with God transforming the darkness and chaos into a world of order, and goodness. A paradise where life can thrive and flourish. And then God creates these amazing beings called Adam in Hebrew, which is us. He shapes us from his very own image and he does this because we have a very special role to play in this new world. Humans are designed to mirror God's character to the world around them. They are appointed as God's representatives to govern his world on his behalf. This responsibility includes unlocking its full potential, nurturing it with care, and ensuring that life thrives abundantly. God blesses the humans, a pivotal theme throughout this book. He entrusts them with a garden as a starting point to shape this new world. Most importantly, humans have the freedom to decide how they will construct this world, which is symbolized by the existence of the tree of good and evil. Until this point, God has provided clear guidance on what is good and what is not. But now God gives them free will. Will they trust God's definition of good and evil, or will they seek autonomy and decide for themselves? It's a pivotal moment in the story of Genesis, highlighting the profound decision-making power given to humans. Rebelling against God means embracing death as it signifies turning away from the very source of life itself. This truth is symbolized by the tree of life in Genesis. In the narrative, the snake appears in the story. This creature, created by God, reveals itself as a rebellious being that is opposed to God. Its sinister intent becomes clear. It seeks to lure humans into rebellion also, therefore leading them towards their own demise. The snake spins a different tale about the tree and the choice. It argues that grasping the knowledge of good and evil won't lead to death at all, in fact, it promises that this knowledge is the path to life and to becoming like God themselves. The tragic irony here is profound, humans were already like God, designed to reflect his image. Yet, instead of trusting God, they choose themselves and in that moment, everything breaks and darkness spreads. The first thing that is destroyed, is the trust between the man and the woman who now suddenly realize their vulnerability. They respond by making clothes to cover themselves, hiding their bodies from each other. God and humans weren't as close anymore, which was really sad. They ran away and hid from God. When God found them, they started blaming each other for being naughty first. At this point in the story, everything pauses. Instead of more story, there are short poems where God talks to the snake first, and then to the humans. God tells them all the bad things that will happen because of what they did. God spoke to the snake, saying, even though you seem to win now, you will end up defeated, eating dust. Then God promised that one day, a special person, a descendant of the woman, would come. This person would deal a deadly blow to the snake's head. While this sounds like good news, there's a catch. The victory will come at a price because the snake will also strike the descendant's heel as it gets defeated. It's a mysterious promise about this victor who will be wounded. Looking at the story up until now, you can see that this is a kind act from God. The humans had just disobeyed, but what does God do? He promises to save them. However, this doesn't mean that the consequences of their choice will disappear. So God tells them that from now on, Every part of their life together, whether at home or in the fields, will be filled with sadness and pain because of what they did wrong, and it will eventually lead to their death. After this part, the story goes downhill. From chapters 3 to 11, it shows how things got worse because of the rebellion, and how people's relationships fell apart all over. The first example was Cain and Abel. Cain felt very jealous of his brother and wanted to hurt him badly. God warned Cain not to let his jealousy take over, but Cain didn't listen. He ended up doing something very wrong, he hurt and killed his brother Abel in the field. Afterwards, Cain went on to build a city where violence and oppression were common. 
This is illustrated in the story of Lamech. He becomes the first man in the Bible to have more than one wife, treating them like possessions. Then, he sings a song boasting about being more violent and vengeful than even Cain was. After this, there's a strange story about the sons of God. Some say these were evil angelic beings, while others think they were ancient kings who claimed to send from gods. Similarly to Lamech, they took as many wives as they pleased and had children called the Nephilim, who were powerful warriors of ancient times. Regardless of which interpretation is correct, the main idea is that humans are creating kingdoms that bring violence and increasing corruption into God's world. Because of this, God is deeply saddened. Humanity is destroying his beautiful world and causing too much harm to each other. Out of a strong desire to preserve the goodness of his world, God cleanses it from humanity's wickedness with a massive flood. However, God protects one righteous man named Noah and his family. God appoints Noah as a new beginning, like a new Adam. He blesses Noah and sends him out into the world again. It seems like this time all will work out for the better. Yet, Noah also fails. In a garden, he plants a vineyard and becomes extremely drunk. One of his sons, Ham, does something disgraceful to him while he is in this state. So, our new Adam finds himself naked and ashamed again. And so, the cycle starts anew. It all starts with the birth of the city of Babylon. In ancient times, People in Mesopotamia gathered together because they had a new invention, bricks. With this new technology, they could build cities and towers bigger and faster than ever before. And so they built a monument to mankind's power. It's a symbol of human defiance and pride, echoing the rebellion in the garden. In response, God humbles their arrogance and disperses them across the earth into different languages and territories. These diverse stories in Genesis 1-11 all highlight a central theme, God repeatedly gives humans opportunities to make things right in his world, but humans consistently ruin these chances. These narratives suggest that we inhabit a world originally good but now corrupted, where we have individually decided what is right and wrong and have failed. As a result, we all play a part in creating a world filled with broken relationships, leading to strife, violence, and eventually death. But there is hope! God promised that one day a special person, a descendant, will come, a wounded victor who will conquer evil at its root. So, despite humanity's wrongdoing, God remains committed to blessing and saving his world. If you enjoyed watching this, please like, share, and subscribe, so that others may benefit as well. Thank you, and God bless.